Are you going to put me in prison and I'm gonna rot and die? Please don't cut off my head. I'm just waiting. And I'll be preparing them to hold on the outside. Sometimes I'm looking in. One, one. What's the address? Your emergency. Walk to County Lenny. I'm transferring over a caller on Big Bend at the dead end just south of Rivera. And he came upon a 12 year old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. Stabbed? Correct. Okay. Sir, are you still there? Yes. Hi, sir. So, is are you with this 12 year old female? Yeah, she says she's having trouble breathing. She said she was stabbed multiple times. Stabbed multiple times? <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, dear God, this is really happening. Schizophrenia, oppositional defiant disorder, shared psychotic disorder. These are just a few of the diagnoses made by psychological experts in an attempt to understand why one big delusion caused two 12-year-olds named Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire to do something absolutely awful to their friend Peyton. On the sunny morning of Saturday, May 31st, 2014, a man riding his bike in Waukesha, Wisconsin, would stumble upon a horrifying scene. Okay, sir, are you with her right now? Yes. Is she awake? She's awake. Is she um, breathing? Yeah, she's breathing. She said she can take shallow breaths. She's alert. Okay, stay with her. We're sending the police department. Don't hang up, okay? Okay. Okay. Hold on, Smith, sir. We're sending officers. Okay. Is there any assailant around? Uh, I didn't even look. I don't see anybody. Is there any bleeding going on? Her clothing has got blood on it. Where are the wounds? Do you see where the wounds are? No, I'm, I don't know if I should be rolling her over and checking or not. Okay, just stay with her and just let me know if she's conscious or alert or stops breathing or anything. Hold on, I'm going to talk to the ambulance. Police are also en route. I'm bothering you at all? You want shade? Okay. Who did that to you? Why don't you want to talk? If you better not to talk, then we won't talk. Give your energy. Later that day, Peyton's best friends would be discovered sitting on the side of the I-94 freeway, covered in blood. Today, we'll be taking a look at the harrowing interrogations that followed. You'll hear the girls refer to Peyton as Bella at times. This is a nickname the victim went by since first grade, when there were two Peytons in her class. One thing that stands out about these interviews is the lack of parental presence. For children this age, it is unusual, although there is no statute requiring it. And the other thing that makes these clips so different from what we usually cover is that there was virtually no need for classic interrogation techniques because the suspects are extremely forthcoming with talking about exactly what they did, to a shocking degree. Morgan sits doubled over, as if trying to minimize her presence. And then, one of the strangest openings to an interrogation I've seen in a while. Thank you guys for having this run away. So, live in the forest? I don't know. I told her that we were going to die. What? Because you can't just live in a forest. Morgan is generally passive and cooperative while waiting. Just waiting for somebody to come back to you know, look at a couple things on you, okay? Okay. But all of a sudden, she pipes up to ask about the status of her victim. Do you know what happened to Bella? What happened to Bella? Is Bella like, your friend? Mm -hmm. she's, the, she's not Anissa, she's the one who was stabbed. It's stabbed? I'm not really sure. Is she dead? I don't know. Um, she wants to take her to the hospital. Maybe no. What? I was just wondering. Although mostly quiet, Morgan is curious about the procedures taking place. Right. Can you kind of try to get underneath your nails here a little bit? What are you doing? This is a DNA swab. This is just starting to see, like, maybe who you were around or who you touched a little bit earlier today. She's noticeably fidgety and agitated, making odd, repeated arm movements, doing a sort of dancing, shaking motion, and performing a repetitive hand motion, which could be symptoms of her mental illness. Within several weeks of her arrest, Morgan would be diagnosed with early onset schizophrenia. After her clothing is taken for evidence, an interrogator starts with opening questions to get her feeling comfortable and establish a baseline from which he will determine if future answers are truthful or not. Everybody been nice to you? Mm -hmm. 
Sounds like you've had a long day so far. Well, I'm a detective here at the Waukesha Police Department. Okay. Okay. And something happened to you with, uh, looks like two of your friends. And so I got to talk to you about that for a little bit. Okay. So I got some questions for you today. Mm-hmm. How old are you? I'm 12. 12. So you just had a birthday not too long ago? Yeah. What'd you do for your birthday? Um, Molly and I had sushi and cupcakes and daddy. He then starts to establish a rapport with her by asking casual questions and relating her birthday to his own daughter. He may also be having issues accepting that a seemingly sweet little girl is sitting in front of him, accused of such a horrible crime. He's likely trying to assess her mental state. That's funny, my daughter just had her 11th birthday and got sushi for her birthday too. You're a year older than her though, but her birthday was last week too. Pretty close in age. It's funny that you guys both like sushi. So did you guys get presents for your birthday? Mm-hmm. Where'd you get? Tickets to a Star Trek convention. Where's that at? I don't know. When is it coming up or? It's soon. Do you like Star Trek? Yeah. When's your last day of school coming up? I don't know. I'm not excited though because I like school. Really? That's good. That's, my daughter's like that. Morgan may have liked going to school, but in a lot of ways, she didn't fit in. And reading through the legal documents for this case shows that there were several warning signs she exhibited in the classroom. Teachers say Morgan was an odd kid and a loner. Frankly, all the other kids thought she was weird, and her instructors assumed she was trying to act bizarre on purpose to gain attention. As the school year continued, however, they began to realize there may have been something more sinister brewing under the surface but they would put the pieces together all too late. It all started with quirky but seemingly innocent behavior. One day in the beginning of the school year, Morgan chased after other kids and barked at them, an incident that one teacher only described as strange. She would run away from other kids and say Snape, the Harry Potter character, was chasing her. But her behavior was about to go from quirky to disturbing. A group of girls found Morgan playing with blood in her fingers, they reported the incident to her math teacher who proceeded to contact her mother. Morgan's mother replied that Morgan had been going on scary websites. One of these websites was the Creepypasta Wiki, a website consisting of fictional horror stories and online urban legends. The teacher suggested that Morgan no longer visit these types of websites, but it doesn't seem her advice was taken. At one point, Morgan's extreme behavior led to her suspension from school. She snuck a rubber mallet into her locker Unfortunately for Morgan, when she opened the locker, it fell onto the ground in front of her peers, who reported it. Morgan told the principal that the mallet was for her protection. When pressed on the issue by the school counselor, she stated she only said it was for protection because she didn't know what else to say. Once she was suspended, she crumbled to the ground and cried. The principal then witnessed Morgan talking to herself and noted that it was odd, odd enough to report this to her parents as well. Once Morgan returned to school, other students began noticing a strange journal she would carry around, and one student noticed she had written the word die. Again, Morgan found herself getting into trouble, and this time she was extremely distressed. She was particularly worried about getting into trouble at home. When her parents were contacted, her father stated he was aware of the journal and had told Morgan not to take it to school. Overall, Morgan was a troubled and strange child, but she did have one best friend, and that was Peyton Leitner. Peyton had been friends with Morgan since fourth grade, where she had often noticed her sitting alone. She reached out to Morgan, and despite her unusual habits, the two became best friends. And this act of kindness would come back to bite her in the worst ways when Morgan met Anissa Wire. By all appearances, Anissa was relatively normal in comparison to Morgan and could be described as a teacher's pet. She often reported any student who wasn't following the directions and had a temper. Still, she was generally liked by her peers, though she didn't have many close friends outside of her small circle and struggled connecting to others. This would change when she met Morgan early in the school year and soon after, Peyton. Peyton wasn't particularly fond of Anissa. She described her as rude, hitting people all the time, and using curse words. 
but she only behaved this way when she was around Morgan, as though she was trying to impress her. The dynamics in friend groups of three can be tricky to navigate, and it is clear that this case was no different. How long? Um, I can't really tell who's in Lake and doesn't like. So you think she dislikes Ellen? Probably, yeah. She always calls her, I don't want to say it. School me. She always calls her a bitch. Why? I don't know. Because she's being one? I'm just assuming. I don't really know what the definition is. So do you like Bella pretty much? You've ever been mad at her? She was my only friend for a long time. Because Why would you hurt your only friend? It was necessary. What do you mean necessary? I don't know. Somebody exactly. told you that? Mm-hmm. Does Anissa have any other friends? Mm-hmm. I hate her other friends. And where are other friends? Her other friends? Nice. Um, there's this girl named Frankie. And she seems to hate me. And there's this girl and I don't know her name. So Frankie is the one that doesn't like you? Frankie doesn't like me. She said I was creepy. I do smile. As Morgan began hanging out with Anissa more frequently, Peyton noticed a drastic and disturbing change, and so did Peyton's family. Peyton's mother didn't want her hanging out with Morgan, as she believed she was a bad influence who got into trouble at school. In fact, there was even a strange incident involving Morgan at the Leitner household. At Peyton's sleepover, her parents found Morgan setting papers on fire in their basement. They told Peyton she should no longer have any contact with Morgan, but she refused and Morgan's behavior only continued to escalate when she and Anissa's Slender Man obsession began. Morgan showed violent inclinations even in video games, telling Peyton she wanted to set her Sims house on fire and starve her characters. She snarkily complained to Peyton before the sleepover, I don't know why your mom thinks she controls the plans of our party, which of course infuriated Peyton's mother, but she still tried to remain supportive of Peyton's friendships and allowed her to attend unaware of just how unhinged the 12-year-old's two best friends were really becoming. Back in Morgan's interrogation, the officer starts to assess her A&O, alertness and orientation. Do you know who the president is right now? What? Do you know who the president of the United States is? Yes. Who's that? Barack Obama. What do you remember seeing on the news that's going on lately? Gross things. What's gross things? Uh, kidnapping children and not uh, doing things to them. Remember which time was the specific incident? Um, not really. I don't really pay much attention, but it's all gross. It's all gross. Her response that the news is all gross may be a symptom of her mental disorder, and you'll see Morgan's fixation on things she deems gross coming up again later. She's been eerily calm thus far, and now the interrogator seems to get concerned about her mental state. Do you know where you're at right now? What? Do you know where you are right now? Uh... Not really. Where do you think you are? At a police station. Her response appears to be an example of flat affect, wherein a person does not express emotions in the same way normal people might. It explains why she speaks in a dull, flat voice without much facial fluctuation. Morgan's behavior already indicates all the classic signs of schizophrenia, marked by periods of psychosis. There could also be bipolar disorder or some other illness coexisting here. An attorney handling her case would likely seek a court-ordered evaluation long before voir dire, because in the US, we generally don't hold the mentally incompetent accountable for their crimes. We can't try those people because they are entitled to assist in their defense. If they are unable to assist, then such a trial would be unconstitutional. Now let's switch gears and take a look at Anissa's interrogation. You might think that she would act just as detached as Morgan, but the contrast between how the two girls behave in this high-stress situation is striking. All right, I'll just some water. Yeah. Are you doing okay? Are you warm enough in here? Mm -hmm. It gets kind of chilly because of the, uh, of the, the concrete and the marble and stuff. Would you like a blanket? I can give you a blanket. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, do you need anything to eat? Okay. You sure? <laughs> okay. Maybe as you kind of relax a little bit, um, you might find that you're starting to get hungry. But try to drink some water, okay? And I'll, and I'll be right back with you, okay? Anissa has her arms crossed and already sounds to be upset or crying. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. If I just wanted to know how far I walk because I'm usually not very athletic and <laughs> just want to know. I, um, I'm trying to think of some place close to where I live. You know the keyword that closed down in the location? Off of Sunset? I do. Mm -hmm. I walked from there, Morgan, I walked from the condos close to there, the marshy area, um, all the way to Steinhoffel's, to um, where the sheriff found us. Okay. Do you know how far that would be? You know, I'm not real certain. I think, uh, why don't I just try to get some specifics as to where, because I honestly don't know where the deputies found you, and I'm being 100% honest with you. Because this whole time that I'm going to be talking today, I'm, I'm going to be very honest, and I'm not, uh, I, I'm not saying any tricks or anything, okay? I see that you're upset, and, um, but I will try to find out that information for you. Asking the female officer how far she walked is an odd, borderline inappropriate question. Perhaps this could be an attempt to disassociate from the situation by changing the topic. Um, this is about Morgan. She can be a little jumpy and lay it off task and look around and forget what she's saying in the middle of the sentence a lot. Hmm. Okay. Because, like, she says she hears boyfriend too. But I just wanted to tell you. Uh, so we're aware of yeah. that. Okay. Maybe not. Okay. Put off by that. Okay. Well, thank you for telling me that. Okay. Okay. I'll be right back. She says that Morgan hears voices. This may be true and would be an indicator of schizophrenia, which commonly passes into the prodrome phase during adolescence and is marked by hallucinations, including voices. It could be that Anissa wants to exploit this aspect of Morgan's behavior to draw attention away from herself and bring her conspirator into question with the officer. But of course, we can't be sure of her intentions. Meanwhile, her interrogator is very cordial. It's likely that her being a young woman dealing with a young girl gives an early advantage when it comes to gaining the suspect's trust and compliance. So, I need to know... Um, the story as to what happened today because it's been quite a quite a day, you know, and, and even stuff that happened, you know, yesterday. And I kind of know bits and pieces, but I don't know the full on truth. And, I, and the only people that know, you know, really what happened are people that were in the place that where it happens. Okay, um, your parents know that you're here talking to me. Okay, and um, they're I'm glad there's they're they're so glad that you're safe. They're, we were scared for you guys. Okay. Unlike Morgan, who is stoic and largely unbothered when discussing even violent subject matter, Anissa seems to be barely holding herself together while answering introductory questions about her life. And immediately after her rights have been read, she breaks down a bit. In understanding these about rights, are you willing to speak with me and tell me what happened to me? Is that a yes? <laughs> the silly thing about this was I didn't know I was in danger until after the Morgan David Payton or Bella did people call her? They call her Bella. Okay. You go to school with Payton? Yes, Bella. Okay. This seems to be an unusual trigger, and while it may be genuine, it suggests there could be an act being played. It could be a diversionary or distraction technique. Granted, it could also just be a young girl overwhelmed by the reality that she's gotten in way over her head. Can we, can we start from the beginning so you guys, this was a birthday party, right? The interrogator moves herself closer to the suspect and leans forward, closing distance and uses open body language so as not to be imposing, offering reassurance and building trust. She also asks a very open-ended question. Tell me what happened. 
to get Anissa talking freely. Hey, can you tell me what happened? So, um, there's this website called um, The Creepy Boss Wiki. Okay. It's full of, like, horror stories that are meant to purposely scare you through, like, online literature and all that. Okay. And there's one of them called Slenderman. It's, like, really Slenderman. It's Slender? Slenderman. Oh, Slenderman. I see it. Yeah. Okay. And um, we had these proxies or servants, as people call them. Okay. Masky and Tidy. And um, Morgan said, hey, Anissa, we should be proxies. And I was like, okay, how would we do that? And that was around um, end of December, beginning of January. Okay. What's interesting is that Anissa immediately jumped into talking about Slender Man when asked to explain what happened, while Morgan doesn't even mention him until way later in her interrogation. Perhaps this shows us where the two girls' priorities, understanding, and motives for the crime differ. In a proxy again, what is a proxy? It's like um, a servant or like someone who's like in charge of like the, um, whichever, um, I, they kind of don't have a choice. When there's, like, the really big, um, he's, like, head of it all, supposedly. Okay, so Slender's the big guy. Yeah. The top guy. And the proxies are his puppets. Yes, that's how people put the puppets. Oh, okay. Boy, I don't even, I never even heard this before, okay? This interrogator would later explain that she's never gone into an interview as blind as she had this one. She'd initially assumed the ordeal would be some petty fight over a boy. Never would she have expected the real motive behind the crime that Anissa is describing. All right, so back in December, January, Morgan um, yeah. told you, like, hey, we, we should be proxies, I think. Yeah. And you know, in said what, like... I said, okay, how would we do that? And she said, we have to kill Bella. Okay. Okay, and do you know why she said that? Like, why she said Because we had to supposedly prove ourselves worthy to wonder. Both girls seem entirely cooperative and willing to spill the beans with very little prompting. In fact, the lack of hesitation on Anissa's part suggests that something is very wrong here. We know she didn't think that Peyton survived the attack, so we can infer that she would believe she played a part in a murder. However, Anissa might be under the assumption that if she didn't do the actual stabbing, then at most she would only be a witness and not in any trouble, which is incorrect. We can also infer that there is a mental defect at work here where the victim simply cannot comprehend the nature of seriousness of the crime on an adult level. This is a common problem with juvenile law where children are often treated as smaller versions of adults. Aside from some limited U.S. Supreme Court rulings, juvenile law is a matter left to the states. With Morgan's interview, we're going to see a similar naivete. So today they asked me to come in and talk to you a little bit mm -hmm. about what's been going on with you. So it seems like you and your friends had something that happened this morning, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure how far back that went. So I gotta try to get an understanding of sort of about what's all going on here with your friends, okay? So but before I do that, I gotta read you a couple questions. Okay. Okay. Have you ever had your rights read to you before? Yes. What was that for? Uh, earlier today when I was in a car with the police officer. Did you understand your rights then? Yeah. Anisha had already told me them. Uh -huh. Morgan quickly agrees to talk and signs the form after being read her Miranda rights without really thinking about it, which is never a good move. So what's going on with you? Why do you think you're here today? Uh, I don't know. Uh, because Anisha and I ran off after hurting Bella. Tell me what happened with Bella. Um, what do you mean? 
The interrogator then similarly sets in with open-ended questions, prompting her to speak in an unguided fashion. Tell me what happened when you first woke up this morning. Anissa and I woke up at like 5.30 in the morning, and it was before Bella, so we went downstairs and we took quizzes on quota. Mm -hmm. And they were really weird. It was like, what... What website? Quotev.com. Quotev? Uh-huh, it's a quiz website. It's a Q-U. O-T-E-M. Wait, B. Okay. So you're taking quizzes and then what happened? Um, and then Bella woke up and came downstairs by us. And then we took more quizzes with her this time. Morgan and Anissa were obsessed with Quotev, and in fact, less than an hour before Peyton would be found bleeding on the sidewalk, Anissa attempted to ask Peyton a bizarre question that she claimed was from the quiz website. What would happen if someone came up to you and tried to stab you? Peyton, not reading too much into it at the time, simply replied, well, I would probably scream. Okay, that would happen. And then he went upstairs and played with Silly Buddy. Oh, we're all upstairs. Um, Bella, Anissa, and I. Okay. And then we played dress up, and I dressed up as Data. And, um, Anissa dressed up as, she called it a prostitute roll. It was sort of inappropriate. Where did you find the clothes? They were mine. That I collected over the years from, like, concerts and stuff and Halloween. And Bella was a princess. While Bella was changing into the pink dress, we we kind of whispered, talked about it for like three seconds. Sure. Whispered. Um, we're going to do it today at the park. That's what Morgan said. And then Anissa suggested that we get changed. And then um, when Bella went to get changed, we sat and waited for her to finish and then it was Anissa's turn and so I had Morgan folds her arms between her body and the seat back during this part of the story. This demonstrates concealing behavior, perhaps because she omitted the conversation Anissa said they had at this point concerning killing Peyton at the park. So I took it and I opened it and then I put it in the silly putty and then she came back and she thought it was funny, and then she threw the silly putty at the ceiling. And she was like, wait, 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 it's sticky now. And then, since it was sticky now, we had to get it off of the ceiling, I think. They were also playing with, like, silly putty. We were downstairs again. Morgan was playing Sims, and Bella and I were playing with our silly putty. Downstairs in the basement, or? It made funny party noises. Okay. And then I had to get changed out of my costume, and uh, um, then I needed to go to the bathroom, so she came to the bathroom and I got changed in the shower, and then she insisted on applying lipstick. And then we Wait, had, you saw uh, And then I was wearing lipstick, and she was wearing lipstick. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? And then we came back upstairs, and we played with my cat. Morgan pulls her arms into her shirt all the way, another indicator of furtive or concealing behavior. And then Issa told me to grab my things and because we had to go to the park. And then we took Bella to the park with us. As the trio got ready to head out to David's park, Peyton noticed something very peculiar. Morgan was packing a large bag with granola bars, pictures, and clothes and Peyton asked why in the world they need a supply bag for a trip to the nearby park. Morgan seemed unfazed and replied that they might need a snack, and they were off. Before leaving, though, Morgan grabbed one last thing, a knife, and tucked it into her waistband. Anissa described Morgan subtly showing her that she had secured the knife while they were on their way to the park. So there, so I look at her like this. Okay. And then she's like, and then she nods to me and then puts her jacket back down and I kind of calmly walk 
um, towards the park. I was trying to stay calm, but I was like shaking a little bit, like I am now. Okay. And what did, why, why did you start shaking? Because I was nervous. What were you nervous about most? Seeing a dead person. Because the last time I saw a dead person, it was at a funeral and it was my uncle. Mm. She's nervous in a self-centered way. In other words, only considering what she will personally experience. She has no empathy for what her victim will experience or endure. This is a common indicator of sociopathic behavior. Though taken alone, it is not enough to make a diagnosis. We like played around a little bit. Uh, Morgan kind of started freaking out a little bit. So I said, Bella, I need to talk to Morgan. She's freaking out a little bit. What was she freaking out about? Chili. She has never done that before. She stabbed apples before. Okay. It was like chopsticks. Okay. But she never actually cut a flesh wound into somebody. How was she freaking out? What was she doing? She said, I can't do this. I'm too scared. You have to. Did she spit all of your life? No. Bella was outside. I told her to go outside and play. Yeah, she was in the bathroom. And then Morgan started freaking out, so I had to hug her and calm her down. It's fascinating how both suspects seem to be going back and forth between calm acceptance of their intended crime and panic in the face of the severity of what they were about to do. So the three years apart? Mm-hmm. And then we played on the slide for a little bit. We went in the bathroom. And then we were singing songs. That's when things took a bizarre turn. While singing depressing songs in the bathroom, Morgan began to pace back and forth. Was there something about her in the bathroom? Dying in the bathroom or something? Uh, yeah, there was a drain for blood to go down, and then um, we were going to sit her in the toilet, lock the door, and then leave for Nicolette. Nicolette. Um, so that it would look like that A, she wasn't dead. And cause, like in the bathroom stall? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it down in the bathroom stall and like sit around the toilet, lock the door, crawl out, and walk. Then the girls try to tell Peyton to go to sleep. From what I read on the Creepy Pops Wiki, it's easier to kill people when they're either asleep or unconscious. Or, and it's also easier if you do not look them in the eye. So I asked Bella if she could like put herself to sleep. Is it okay if I have a blanket? Can I get a joint? Okay. Yeah, let me get you one. Thank you. Yeah, of course. This statement alone shows a lot of planning and devious thought going into the crime. This level of detail will be used in court against Anissa. Because, like, when you look into a person's eyes, you can see yourself. And you don't want to be killing yourself, supposedly, so you don't look in their eyes. But when they're sleeping or unconscious, they can't scream and they go around to make it harder for you. Okay. Uh, so then Morgan called me over to where she was standing, which was by the sink. Okay. So then she said, can you kind of knock her out? Because when I stand up for her every now and then, because Morgan's like prime target for bullies at school, especially okay. Devin. Okay. It's very interesting how she even strives to tie her violence against innocent Peyton into talking about how she defends Morgan from bullies at school. And you should try to knock Bella out. Bella got all mad and stuff. But, and I was pacing in circles, singing a song for Anissa. Why did you guys pick the bathroom to do it? I didn't pick it, so no. I don't know. I guess it is closed off from the rest of the park, but it would be very, very easy. I think she has some flaws in her thinking skills. So, obviously. I didn't choose the location. Eventually, Anissa attempted to trick Peyton into getting inside a bathroom stall. She told her there was vandalism in the toilet bowl, 
and though Peyton didn't really believe her, she still wanted to see it. The three entered the bathroom stall, and Morgan quickly latched the door behind them. The truth is, there's no vandalism, she said. Morgan then directed Peyton to sit in the corner of the stall and held her arms back before saying to Anissa, I thought we agreed you would do this. At some point during this tense trip to the bathroom, Anissa did stand over Peyton before striking her head against the wall in an attempt to knock her out. So I kind of went like that to her forehead and banged her head up against the uh, concrete. Okay. And then she was just like, excuse you, um, push my hand away. So I said, sorry, I got bored and I needed something to do. Plus, my hands got really finicky. I lied. So do you think that that hurt her or did it seem like it done it? It didn't seem like it. So you hit her slightly in the forehead and mm -hmm. her head hit the launch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And you were doing this to knock her off so you guys could kill her in there? Yeah. Basically, and you asked her to fall asleep so you could kill her in there? Yeah. Okay. I don't like screaming. That's what parents can't be handled. It's clear at this point that Anissa was more than willing to forcefully render her friend unconscious just to make the killing easier. The self-centric behavior is fascinating. However, Morgan and Anissa hesitated from whatever they had planned next and left Peyton for the next stall over to talk. Peyton sat and waited. It's unclear exactly what happened to change their plan, but Morgan apparently explained a bit of the creepy pasta lore to Peyton. And I'm like, I couldn't do it in there. Um, Morgan kind of explained, like, Slender and Proxy and all that to her, to Bella, while we were in the bathroom stall. So Morgan hands you the knife? And tells me to keep it concealed. Where is Bella at that time? Um, she's, um, we went in one of the bigger stalls. Mm -hmm. So Bella, um, like, say the door is here. Bella was standing in the corner like this. And then uh, Morgan pulls her forward and then Morgan crouches uh, behind her. Bella crouches in front of her. And then Morgan held um, Bella's arms back. Like, like, what was she trying to do? Was she, she was like trying to restrain her from okay. moving. And what did Bella think of it? She was, she didn't, she, she, her facial expression was confused, but she didn't say anything. Eventually, Morgan stood in front of Peyton, staring at her with her hand rubbing against the bag. This time, Anissa was holding her hands behind her back. But moments later, they strangely said, just go out on the playground and just play. Peyton had enough of their strange games and went outside as they suggested. However, Morgan and Anissa stayed in the bathroom, and when they exited five minutes later, they had weird looks on their faces, like they had just done something. So then after that, I say, hey guys, why don't we go take a walk around the block? That's when I pointed out to Morgan the, um, bushes, the trees and bushes and all that, and say, you can take her in there and do the deed. Doing the deed is another phrase Anissa says to psychologically disconnect herself from the idea of taking another person's life. After we go into the woods, we say we're going to play a hide and seek, and Morgan is going to be a seeker. So we hide, I tell Bella to lay down, stay fringed in the dirt. Um, like, so you suggested her stomach? Okay, you know, so you suggested to take a walk around the block and, and you pointed out the woods to Morgan, Morgan and said, We could do the deed there. Okay. And then um, she says, I'm not laying on my stomach in dirt. It's all squishy and there are twigs and sharp rocks everywhere. So you're going to play hide and seek, right? Mm -hmm. Play hide and seek, and then she was supposed to be the seeker, so mm -hmm. her eyes from being to see where you guys ran, you wanted her to lay down in the dirt? No, Morgan was the seeker, oh. and Bella and I were hiding. Okay, so you told her to, a place to hide. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and why did you want her to lay down in the dirt? So that I could sit on her chest, and, and well, so that I could pin her down and get it better over with, and then we could leave. You're gonna, you're gonna pin her down? Mm-hmm. 
Morgan told me to bear down. Okay. And so like I kind of she said no, so I kind of pushed her forward and sat on her um, hip, and then she said, "Ow, I can't bring you! Ow, ow, ow!" So then I got off because she was making a lot of noise. Was she kneeling or something? Or yeah, she was kneeling, and then I pushed her. Um, she was kneeling like this. Okay, I think with flowers and all that. Okay. I was standing right here. Okay. I pushed her over. Okay. So like. She's like, there now. Okay. And then I sit right here on her hand while she's like, that. And then she started complaining that she couldn't breathe, so I, and I got off of her because she was making a lot of noise. Okay. Okay. Then what happened next? And I told Morgan that she's not laying down. And then she said, tackle her and I'll stab her. So then, no, um, there was a time when Maureen gave you the knife. Mm -hmm. And said that she couldn't do it. When was I, that? It was like, like before. Hi, G. It was like after I tackled Bella and sat on her hip. Okay. So then, so you tell Morgan she's not laying down, is that what it happened? Mm -hmm. And then she goes, okay, tackle. Um, okay, tackle her. And then I tackle her, yeah. and I get up, and then Morgan hands me the knife and says, I can't do it, you know where all the soft spots are? Like, I only know where soft spots are because I used to watch um, Doomsday Preppers, and it said that a hard blow to, like, the stomach or the throat with, like, Oh, a sucker in between your fingers can do some serious damage. A sucker being like a knife or something? No, a sucker being an actual lollipop. Oh. Okay. And then she drunks on Bella and she held her to the floor. Wait, did I need to do this? Mm -hmm. Where did this happen at? In some trees. How did you guys end up in, in by the trees? Because we were going to look at like plants and stuff. How far off the road was it? Not very. And then we stabbed her. And you stabbed her? With a knife. You stabbed her from what? Huh? You stabbed her from what? A knife. How did you stop her? I said stab. Oh, stabbed her? Mm-hmm. So, this happened in the woods? It wasn't in the woods, it was just a little group of trees. Morgan admits to the stabbing in the same matter-of-fact tone she described her morning activities. Her demeanor is almost as if she's talking about something make-believe, which points to her mental illness. Anissa provided a bit more detail about what led up to the stabbing. Yeah. And I tell her she has to do it and to go with it and then she asked when and I said whatever you want and she said I'm taking, I'm doing it when you want me to. So she, um, so on, so she gives you the knife <laughs> and says you do it. And then I give it back to her and say you do it, go ballistic and she said okay I'll go ballistic whenever when you say you want me to. Anissa apparently told Morgan she was too squeamish to do it herself. She explained that Peyton didn't hear this horrifying conversation because she was playing with flowers. There's clearly some mental disease going on here. Normal people don't act like this as far as we know. And so, despite appearing outwardly sane, Anissa also has some mental disease or defect that will likely factor into her trial proceedings. I told her that I didn't care when she did it. Um, she said, whatever. So I started walking away, and then like when I was five feet away, I said now, and Morgan said, don't be afraid, I'm only a little kitty cat, and uh, jumped on top of Bella and stabbed her repeatedly. Okay. Like, she told me that she got her in the lung, right here, six times, and then like in the leg a few times. Okay. And then she, was like, she walked away covered in blood and then Peyton started screaming, I trusted you, I hate you all. 
then I told her to lay down and be quiet because I didn't want the tension being drawn. So I said, lay down and be quiet, you'll lose blood slower. So then she laid down. Maria tried to clean her wounds with a leaf. Did she try to get off? The, the yeah, she tried cool. to get up. She said that she couldn't see, she couldn't walk, and that she couldn't breathe. Morgan uh, Peyton was saying this? Yes. So after Morgan stabbed Peyton, did Morgan just get off of her and walk, start walking away? or? Um, Morgan got off of her when I turned around, and Peyton was wobbling around um, holding up trees, saying, I hate you, get help. Okay. And um, I, that's when I told her to lay down and be quiet. You lose blood fat slower. Okay. I really, you just wanted her not to draw attention? Mm-hmm. Okay. So then, um... Was she, when, when, when Peyton was being stabbed, was she laying on the ground? Or Morgan she... pushed her to the ground face first mm-hmm. and went ballistic. Went ballistic. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, um, so Maury is looking and somehow gets herself to stand up. Mm-hmm. But she's wobbling and then she collapses okay. in, near a ditch. And um, then she says, I can't see. And she starts kind of crying and whimpering a little bit. And then, um, And then Morgan tries to clean a big wound on her leg with um, part of a leaf, but it didn't help that much. Why was she trying to do that? Because because before this, Peyton was Morgan's best friend. Morgan was Peyton's only friend. So it was hard for her to do that. The interrogator later looped back to ask why Morgan said the bizarre kitty cat line before the attack. I said, no, Morgan said, don't be afraid. I'm only a little kitty cat and then lunged for Peyton, the ballistic. What do you think she meant by that? Don't worry, I'm just a little kitty cat. Uh, she said that she was going to draw cat whiskers on her face if she became a proxy, and that would be her catchphrase, like with Jeff, Jeff the Killer and to go to sleep. So did you, did you guys talk about doing this before him? And you told me we had to. Why? Because she said that he'd kill our families. Who's he? Um, a man. I didn't know him, but Anissa knew him. How was she on? I don't know. Anissa told me about him. Morgan's repetition of the facts remained very simplistic and emotionless, as if recalling the gruesome act doesn't sway her at all. So when you guys went back into the woods, did, did Peyton uh, know anything about, or Bella know anything about this? No. Where'd you guys get the knife from? My kitchen. Your kitchen? Anissa did. So who left the house with them? I think Anissa did. It was in the bag. It's interesting to note that Morgan says Anissa was carrying the knife in the bag, while Anissa previously claimed that Morgan had it in her waistband. Anissa packed the bag. We what? both packed the bag. We knew about this since, since December. One day she just told me that we had to. What do you mean she told you you had to? I mean, she told us we had to kill her. Who did? Anissa. When she says us, what do you mean us? Who's us? Um. The two, you mean the two here or yeah. somebody else? There's a uh, nobody else. Did Bella say anything when you guys did, when were stabbing her? Um. She said two things. But it was afterwards. She said, I trusted you, and she said, I hate you. And she kept whispering, I can't see over and over and over and over again. I can still hear it. After the merciless stabbing, the girls lied to Peyton that they were going to get help. 
And then she started to cry with no tears, but you could hear her cry. And then, what were you guys doing, watching her? We were like slowly backing away because we took the opportunity to run. Okay. Like she couldn't see us, so we took the opportunity to run. Did you tell her you were gonna go get help? Mm -hmm. Did you want to actually get her help? No. I I kind of wanted to, but I know I knew Morgan wouldn't want me to. <laughs> like we've planned this for a while. Flight from the scene of a crime is an unsurprisingly often used indicator of guilt. So I have a so you guys, how many times do you think you stabbed her? I don't know. It happened very quickly. All I heard was screaming. How many times did you guess? I don't know. So you ran through the woods or did you run up the road? We ran up the road. We were running and then we hid in tall, very tall grass. Not the tall grass for that, that we were found in. And then these police officers showed up, so of course we hid. Do you know which way you went then? What else did you see on your... Well, I think it said that we had to go to Walmart to refill our water bottles, and we did. Which Walmart? I don't know. Is it like a food store one? No. The, the one over... It's a huge one. On West Avenue? Mm -hmm. So we refilled our water bottles and went to the bathroom and washed the blood off our hands. Well, I regret giving you this information later. You know, this information will be used to try to get you some help so we, you don't have to hear those screams and don't have to worry about hurting anybody anymore. Okay. That's my goal here, okay? So we gotta figure out how we're gonna do that. Peyton would drag herself out of the woods to the sidewalk where she was found at 9.53 a.m., just 20 minutes after the attack. She had severe lacerations and punctures throughout her entire body and was in extreme pain. She couldn't talk as it hurt too badly and had to answer most of the questions from law enforcement with a nod or a shake of the head. Her injuries were life-threatening. One stab wound to her chest missed a major artery near the heart by a measly one millimeter. A doctor later emphasized that if the knife had gone the width of a human hair further, she would not have survived. There was fluid around her heart and an injury to her liver, and she was rushed off to intensive care. You'll notice that Morgan is already starting to paint herself as a follower in this crime by suggesting that Anissa told her they had to do this. So when do you think it was that you started talking about killing Peyton? You told me before December. Uh -huh. I don't know what it was. It wasn't mine either. Was it Nisa's again? I think so, yeah. You see, he's been playing this a while? Since December. She was my best friend since fourth grade. Who was? Peyton. So why did you pick Peyton? I didn't pick her. Who picked her? Whoever Anisa was talking about. She made it seem necessary, and I figured if it was necessary, then I was. So the person that talked to Anissa told him who to do it? Yep. It was more of a message. I don't know. She didn't go very in-depth. So what else have you guys been doing to plan for this? Just talking about it? The two of you? Has yeah. anybody else known about it? No. So how did you know how to... Were you guys, what were you trying to do with her when you stabbed her? Kill her. I might as well just say it, we were trying to kill her. I don't know why it was necessary that it was her, but it seemed very necessary. I don't know why it was necessary, but it seemed necessary. This statement suggests Morgan has little to no volitional control over her own thoughts. So why did you want to kill Peyton? Huh? Why did you want to kill Peyton? It's not that we wanted to. Before you said it was necessary? Mm -hmm. Why was it necessary? Because... The interrogator revisits this point, but Morgan only answers, because. I can't figure out what part of the illness this represents, but it's just bizarre from a legal perspective. Criminals almost always have a reason for their crime, some way to justify it and square it internally. Here, we don't see any of that at all. Yet at certain points in the interview, Morgan does express a fear that something bad might happen to her family. 
There's no logic present here. Whatever is going on, we are seeing the manifestations of a malfunctioning brain. However, when we compare her story with Anissa's, it is clear to see that both girls are making their partner out to be the leader behind the scheme. This is very important because although both girls are blatantly admitting to trying to kill their friend, determining who conceived of the plan versus who just took part can establish the nature of different charges against different suspects. Is she really into the creepy costume? Is she like, yeah. So you, you said, okay, well, how do we do that? And she said, well, we have to kill, we have to kill Bella, meaning Pete. Yes. If you're on the internet a lot, or at least you were in the 2010s, there's a good chance you already know who Slenderman is. But if not, here's a quick rundown on everything you need to know about the infamous horror figure. The Creepypasta website consisted of internet urban legends and horror stories intended to scare those who read them. Essentially, these were fake stories meant to scare kids. But for Morgan and Anissa, these stories would begin to manifest into something real. Slenderman is a fictional supernatural character that originated in photoshopped images on these something awful forums, often depicted creepily standing behind children. He quickly spread as a meme and gained popularity, along with internet lore. He's often described as a thin, tall, humanoid creature with a featureless face. There was also a popular game where the player would have to collect notes in a dark forest during the middle of the night while avoiding Slenderman. When I first heard about this case, I actually assumed the girls chose the woods for their attack to imitate the game's eerie setting, but it appears to just be a coincidence that this ended up being the scene of the crime, since it wasn't their first choice. Regardless, based on the online fictional stories that spawned from the meme, Morgan and Anissa believe that Slenderman abducted children, killed people, and lived in a mansion in the forest. It didn't click that these stories were fake, they believed they were real, and that's where the trouble all started. They wanted to prove the skeptics wrong. And so he, she said, well, we have to kill Bella to prove ourselves to the slender? Yes. And what did you think of this when she was talking? I was surprised, but like also kind of excited because I wanted proof that he existed because there were a bunch of skeptics out there saying that he didn't exist. And then there's a bunch of photos online and sources online saying that they didn't see him. Okay. So a lot of people believe that the, the slender actually exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of talk about this on the internet, I bet, right? Yeah. Okay. And so you, so you at first thought... Uh, first, at first I was kind of surprised and didn't want to do it, but later I didn't want to leave Morgan all by herself out here because who knows what he creeps her out here. So I decided to go along and tag along, so I said, let it be kind of okay. proof skeptics wrong. Okay. So did you think that you actually had to kill somebody to do it? Yeah. Like for real? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then there's another killer called um, Jeff the Killer on the Creepy Pasta Wiki, but he's um, actually a real person, Jeffrey Woods. He supposedly murdered his whole family somewhere in there. Um, found that out, and we're just like, okay, so we know at least Jeff is real. Okay. So we wanted, so we got our hopes up and thought that everybody else was real. Okay. And then Jeff is called what online? Jeff the Killer. Then supposedly he um, he went insane, so he burned off his eyelids and took a budget knife and cut a big smile on his face. Then his his supposedly long black hair about down to here and um, ice blue eyes. Also. At times, it is unclear if Anissa thought she was involved in a sort of game or a real life or death situation. There is some question as to Anissa's ability to understand what she had agreed to prior to the attempted murder, and after the fact, her comprehension seems to be in question. Her explanations, while accurate, are also couched in very passive terms, like tag along. 
It's likely she is emotionally distancing herself from the act of attempted murder and minimizing the appearance of any affirmative actions in furtherance of the crime. As she continues to describe Jeff the killer and other figures, it becomes obvious from Anissa's tone of voice and sincerity that she has bought into this meme a hundred percent, even choosing to compare herself to his appearance. And he's known to exist. News reports say that he exists. If you go on Google Images and search Jeffrey Woods news article, a bunch of news articles will come up and then there'll be a picture of excuse me, a 17-year-old boy with um who kind of looks like me, but has, but it was a black and white picture. Mm -hmm. And he had kind of the same hair as me also. Okay. Did you cut your hair to make it look like you? No. No. It was just coincidence. coincidence. The interrogator asks if Anissa cut her hair to look like Jeff the killer. The reason for this is to establish if this was a copycat crime, trying to be like Jeff Woods. And so you guys knew that Jeff the killer, an actual killer in this triangle, exists. So you thought it would be exciting to find out, hey, if we can prove, if we can be a proxy and prove and do this, kill, kill Bella, then we know that Slender exists. If we saw him actually mean we think we see him sometimes. Okay. Like when we were walking up to where to where we were going, um we saw him like I saw him out of the corner of my eye on this side. Okay. And then Morgan said she heard a twig crack when no one was moving. Did you think that you guys killed Morgan? Um, yeah. She has no shortage of information to relay about the creepy pasta characters. Okay. Like on a um like a triangle chart, Slender would be up here. Okay. And then be like killers and then proxies. Okay, so killers outrank the proxies. Yeah. And then there's another um creepy pasta that's supposed to be really powerful. Uh, it's like Zalgo or something. It's supposedly a demon with seven mouths that speak in um, six different tongues, but the seventh mouth doesn't speak until the world is about to end or something. Oh. That's what the wiki told me. Leading up to the stabbing, Morgan had even begun incessantly emailing Peyton creepypasta characters, like Jeff the Killer, telling her they were going to come to her window while she slept and kill her. She even began emailing her newspaper articles in an attempt to convince Peyton they were real. And fearing she would tell her mother, Morgan told her, you tell your mother nothing. Peyton became so disturbed by these emails that she began to sleep intentionally facing away from her bedroom window with the blinds closed and window locked, even though her room became uncomfortably warm. Despite Morgan's warning, she told her mother, who researched the characters online with her to prove to her they pose no threat, as they're fake. But Anissa and Morgan, on the other hand, continued to believe they were real. With this background knowledge, it's no surprise that watching Morgan interact with the interrogator shows us more examples of how little grasp she has on reality. This is going to get me arrested, isn't it? Um, I won't shake back any of it. Morgan is already under arrest, and even allowing for her age, she should reasonably understand this. You won't take it back because it's all the truth? It's all the truth. And that's what's important here is to tell the truth. I know. One time I, one time I got suspended because I accidentally brought a hammer to school. Why'd you bring the hammer to school? Because I was cleaning my room and I shoved it in my backpack, so I know that it's important to tell the truth. How long ago was that? A while ago. It was this year, though. <clears throat> but it was an accident. I thought you should know. Like how earlier this year? At the beginning. So are you going to use a hammer to hurt somebody? Or? No, no, it was an accident. An accident? We've been over it. I went over it with the principal. I figure you have access to all those files if you need more information, so I might as well tell you. You're a pretty smart girl. Morgan's mother has come forward to say that her child has lacked empathy since a young age. For instance, when the family showed her the movie Bambi, they were worried she'd be devastated when the mother died. Instead, Morgan apparently just said, run Bambi, run, get out of there, save yourself. 
she wasn't sad about it at all. This example alone might be a one-off, but Morgan's mother claims she can think of many examples of times Morgan hasn't reacted like you would expect a little girl to. I read a lot of books about things like this in the library. What kind of books do you read? I read a lot of books. I read medical dictionaries. I read Harry Potter. I read Star Trek books. I read just random books that I get from um, this one section about, like, the police and things. So, you came back a little bit, so I think she told you that somebody told her or that it was necessary to kill? I was confused a little bit. What do you mean you're confused? I didn't really understand what we were doing, but I just, I was the one who, um, final kill. I don't know if she's alive, though. She's, she's alive. crying. Good. What do you mean you were confused? I mean, I didn't know exactly why we were. I really didn't want to make any fun mad. It's, um, hard enough to make friends. I don't want to lose them over something like this. And I don't know, I didn't know what, what happened if I didn't. Like, Bree and it was, it's our fault. And she said, before we take full responsibility, Having a hard time making and keeping friends likely also stems from Morgan's psychological struggles. As the interrogator starts prompting her to repeat her story, we can see more examples of her lacking social grace. So where, where did you guys get the knife from? My kitchen, I just said that. Okay, and who put it in the bag? Um, I think Anissa told me to. Anissa might as well. It's sort of foggy because I've been trying to block it out. So you're not sure who put it? Um. Morgan is already indicating impatience with the interrogator. Her statement that her recollection of the knife is foggy because she's trying to block it out is probably another symptom of her mental illness, sliding towards possible psychosis. Whose I purse was that that you guys had today? It was my mommy's, but she gave it to me, I think, in like first grade for dress up. So you guys end up in your house, you guys get the knife from your house, mm -hmm. and you guys go down to the park. My parents had nothing to do with this, I promise. I believe you. They seem like very nice people. It's fascinating how quickly Morgan jumps in here to defend her parents. It seems like she thought mentioning her mom's purse would somehow throw them under suspicion. And even as out of touch with reality as Morgan is, that protective instinct towards her family was at the forefront of her mind. So you guys have been, how, when you said you guys have been playing this from December, did you, when did you decide that you were going to do this today? In December, she said. But how, how did you know that uh, May 31st, 2014 was? We didn't know it was going to be May 31st. We knew it was going to be at my birthday sleepover. You have no idea how difficult it was not to tell anyone. She starts speaking very quickly to respond her tone exuding impatience with the officer. She doesn't seem to realize that this is inappropriate behavior for the setting. She told I wanted to be locked up so that I couldn't hurt her, but that time it passed and now I'm in here because we were careless. I knew this would happen. I knew we'd get in trouble. Morgan is absolutely unconcerned about the victim at this point and is even trying to shift blame to Anissa. Overall, she seems very cold and disconnected. So you wanted to get like those to be in trouble? I don't want, I wanted to, I didn't really genuinely want to be locked up, but at one point I sort of did. Just, it seems. So you just decided a while ago that on the sleep overnight that this in is December. what you wanted? Yeah. Why do you think it was your sleep overnight that your Because sleep it was, we were all, we would all be together. It was a flawless plan, actually. Despite Morgan's claims that Anissa told her they had to do it, Anissa made it out as if she couldn't even watch while the crime took place. So Morgan and I were also debating um, who does the deed. And um, at first it was me, but like I said, I was too squeamish and said, no, you do it. So, um, Morgan said, whenever you want, 
so like I finally just had enough and said it now because I was starting to get a little freaked out. And then Morgan jumped on top of Bella and started stabbing her repeatedly and that's when I turned around because I couldn't stand to see that. Okay. And then um, the whole time Peyton was screaming and begging. Saying stuff like, I hate you guys, I'll never forgive you, and I trusted you. Still and, um, sorry. <laughs> so we told her we were gonna get help, but we really weren't. We were gonna run and let her pass away. She uses yet another euphemism, pass away, to avoid facing the reality that they essentially left her to die. At this point, Anissa has made a full indication of who committed the crime, whether truthful or not, Morgan. She has also identified the means, opportunity, and motive of the crime, and therefore a confession has already been cemented. At the very least, she could easily be found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder from this information alone. Further interrogation will determine additional charges or reframe the crime and cause a modification of the charges. At one point, she shows a blood stain on her clothing, believed to have gotten there shortly after the stabbing. You see, Anissa claims that Peyton had gotten up and tried to walk towards a street, stumbling. Anissa grabbed her arm and directed her away, not wanting anyone to see her. Back in Morgan's interrogation, she continues to be incredibly blunt. So many of the things she says sound straight from a horror movie script, instead of a thought a 12-year-old girl would organically conjure up. Perhaps this is an extension of her earlier tendencies to seek attention by acting as out there as possible. Why did you guys go over by the woods? Because we knew what we had to do. We led her there and tricked her. The last thing she said to me, to, to me was, I trusted you. And then she said, I hate you. And then we lied to her. And he just said that she'd go get help. I didn't have anything to do with the lying. Well, that was all on Issa. She said we were going to go get help. How did you trigger it to her? We said that we were going to go bird watching. People who trust you become very gullible. And it was sort of sad. Again, we see the mental illness symptoms in the form of social relationship issues and flattened or non-emotional tone when speaking about disturbing subjects. Not like offensive, well, that's sad, but it was sad to do this. So you guys told me you were going out there to bird watch and then what happened? And then we said that we were going to play hide and seek and then I used to jump there and then it was like, it happened really fast and I keep trying to forget. I keep trying to forget represents attempting to detach from reality, which can be associated with schizophrenia. So you ever play hide and seek? Mm -hmm. Because normally we like playing hide and seek, because hide and seek's a fun game. I like hiding. So you got in that Anissa jumped her? Mm hmm. She said Morgan now. Well, actually, she said Kitty, because her code names for each other were Scorpion and Kitty. She was scorpion because she tends to be aggressive, things like that. So she said Kitty now, or what does that mean? Um, my name was Kitty because, mm -hmm. well, she sort of, I have four cats at home and she says that I act like a cat sometimes. I so when she said Kitty now, what did she do? Then we stabbed her. Who had, who stabbed her first? I think um, and he stopped her first and then I continued and then like, she was like, Morgan, is, make sure she doesn't escape! And then I was like, uh... So you think that it was Anissa first? Mm-hmm. You sure? Yeah. Not really. It's sort of confusing because I've been trying to block out the screams all day. Things are confusing. I've been trying to block out the screams. Shows another symptom here. Disorganized thinking. Psychosis. 
So many things. So then how did you get the knife from a Nissan? She sort of just shoved it into my hand and there it was. And then I didn't know what I did. It was it sort of just happened. These exaggerated, odd physical motions probably also stem from her mental illness. It didn't feel like anything. It was like air. So she put the knife in your hand or what'd you do? Then I just continued to... You know what happened, didn't you? Didn't you? No, I actually don't. Somebody else is like her. They continue to stab her? Mm-hmm. And then we decided that, and then Nisa said that it was enough, and then I was like, I can't see, I can't see, and then I said, I'm sorry. This had to happen, and she was like, why? And then I, I said that I was just, it was necessary, I can't, I can't explain why. Please don't cut off my head. Nobody's going to cut off your head. Morgan asked not cut off her head. Clearly symptom material here. She may be having a precursor to a psychotic episode where she will stop understanding what's real and what is not. At this point, the interrogator has presumably already reasoned that Morgan is suffering from some mental illness or disease, and he will likely not engage with any odd behavior she may have in order to keep the questions moving forward and avoid exacerbating the symptoms. It's possible he has training in dealing with those suffering mental illness, as his answers to her strange questions seem to be worded very carefully. Are you going to put me in prison and I'm gonna rot and die? Morgan's rot and die comment goes to the persecution psychosis aspect of schizophrenia. I don't, well, I don't think that you're going to prison, and I don't think you're gonna rot and die there. Um, we probably got to have somebody talk to you and try to figure out what the best circumstances for you to make sure that you don't have to keep that confusing. Notice how Morgan visibly jumps when hearing the phone ringtone. Increased sensitivity to stimuli is a part of the disease. Even Morgan's behavior when left alone in the interrogation room is intriguing. She sings the same Owl City song two different times one which seems to be about mental health struggles. The song features lyrics like, I wish I had covered all my tracks completely, and is that the light at the far end of the tunnel or just the train? The lyrics towards the end cover similar subject matter. The song talks about how help is on the way, so perhaps this is Morgan's way of trying to self-comfort. She also whispers to herself, fiddles with, and appears to keep dosing herself with her inhaler, traces shapes on the wall with her fingers, hides inside of her shirt, and even pokes a hole in one of her booty socks. The whispering could potentially be her hearing voices in her head and trying to speak with them. But of course, we can't say for sure. When she's brought food, she takes out a few fries, pushes the rest away, and then eats off the table. This may be representative of some sort of dissonant social cognition deficit. Later on, she dumps everything on the table and eats while pacing around the room, which is likely a sign of physical agitation or motor restlessness, which can be signs of either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Morgan also gets up, goes under the table, and then walks around the room, touching things in some sort of pattern behavior. It's yet another classic sign of schizophrenia, though the underlying cause could have multiple origins. At one point, she even indicates indecision on whether she would like to see her parents. I'm not sure if it's possible or not, but did you want to see your mom and dad a little bit here, or, uh, or not, really? Maybe. You want to think about it for a little bit? It's certainly not the answer you'd expect from a little girl from the upper Midwest, and could potentially indicate home problems. Although this isn't clear, especially when we take lines like this into consideration. So when you guys picked up, there was the purse. And what was inside the purse? I don't remember what was all inside the purse. We put pictures of our family inside the purse because Anissa said we might never ever get to come back. 
Next, Morgan and Anissa will talk about what they did in the hours after the crime. Did you do anything to try to help her? No. Um. There was nothing I could have done. Did you think she was dead? Oh, no. Well, I told her done. not to touch her, so I stopped touching her. I did try to help them. I tried to at least clean up her wounds so that she might have been able to escape. There are countless possibilities of ways that the girls could have gotten help. So Morgan's response that there was nothing she could have done except try to clean Peyton's wounds is the result of either willful ignorance or a very bizarre thought process. How did you try to clean up her wounds? It was a large leaf, but she said, no, just don't touch me. I'm sorry, that must have sounded offensive. The girls' accounts of their escape and not getting help goes to consciousness of guilt and can be used in court to show that they knew right from wrong and understood their actions, which could potentially be used to limit or negate an insanity plea. No, I just remember that we went forward and forward and forward and then we passed a bunch of buildings and we went there downtown Waukesha, we went everywhere and actually we were singing the whole time. We took turns singing songs to each other. We were surprisingly calm actually. It was like we hadn't just killed someone or thought that we'd killed someone or stabbed anyone. This was the point where Morgan alluded specifically to Slender Man for the first time in her interview. And we went, we went into a few like ditches with, for, with forests and trees. And I remember we tried to find Slender Man. Trying to find who? Slender. Who's Slender Man? He's, um... He's uh, this tall, faceless man who preys on children. Because we were by a forest and we couldn't help ourselves. So he's a tall, faceless man? Mm -hmm. Why are you trying to find him? What? Why are you trying to find him? Because Anissa said he could help us. I sort of thought that he might kill us if we did find him, though, because he has a tendency to do that. Have you ever met him? No. You've never seen him. Who tells you about him? He's everywhere. How do you know him? A court-appointed forensic psychologist later shared her thoughts on the girl's delusions, pointing out, once you find this character on the internet, you can read all these stories that look real. They look like newspaper articles. It's hard for a lot of people to differentiate, let alone a 12-year-old. Because I've read so many things about him. Where did you read so far? It's called Creepy Pasta. Anissa thinks he's real, and she also thinks Jack the Killer is real, because there's somebody in Milwaukee who's called a smiley face killer, and she thinks that Jack the Killer is him. It was weird. I felt no remorse. I thought I would. I still have this idea in my head that it was necessary. So you don't need to feel any, it's weird that you didn't feel remorse? Mm -hmm. I actually felt nothing. Her expression of feeling nothing shows emotionally flat or detached behaviors and perceptions, which can also be symptoms of schizophrenia. And you said, how do you think for her? Because she said she was scared. And she wondered what we'd gotten ourselves into this time. She explains why they risk going into the Walmart despite their bloody appearance. We considered the fact that we might be like questioned why we were covered in blood, but then we decided it's Walmart. So they're a lot of Uh-huh. There are pictures of people that are like pretty much naked at Walmart. So Nobody looks twice. Anissa explained a bit more about their expectations involving Slender Man through this conversation she and Morgan had while on the run. So I asked Miss Moore and we sat down and uh, talked to uh, how far away we have to go. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to go far away? What was this discussion about? Supposedly Morgan found out that um, 
Thunder lives in the middle of Thunder has this big mansion that all the creepy pastas supposedly live in. Mm-hmm. And it's supposedly in the middle of Nicolette National Park or Forest or whatever. Okay. Up in Lula, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So we were gonna walk the whole way there. I realized it's really, really far. A quick internet search reveals that there are many people who have written and read fictional stories about living in the Slender Mansion with the creepypastas. The common fantasy seems to lie in being accepted as a part of the family of misfits, so to speak. And so for Morgan and Anissa, who were having trouble fitting in at school and finding others who shared their interests, this kind of life was probably very enticing. Because she wanted to walk to Slender. Mm-hmm. She knew that. Um, that if we ask someone for um, directions or anything, we would, the police would probably be called because what is this strange about a blonde girl with creepy eyes walking around with a blood-covered jacket? Mm. And then a girl next to her looking like this, mm. wearing winter boots. Yeah. Mm. As she continues to explain their journey, we see more examples of her not fully appreciating the gravity of the act they'd just taken part in. We were walking and then finally I said, Morgan, I'm thirsty. Can I please sit in a hot drink? Please sit in the shade. And she said, sure. So we, um, so we talked for like three minutes. I tried to eat like two different granola bars or something. One was a, uh, an organic peanut butter one that I didn't like very much. I only took like two nibbles and said that tasted disgusting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I only took one bite of that and then I spit it out because I didn't feel so good. <sighs> Yet in the midst of being worried about the taste of granola bars, Anissa does show small flashes of guilt, like the mental processing of what they'd done was slowly creeping up on her. I really couldn't eat anything because I was still thinking of Bella Lake in the forest area where we left her dying. Sorry. So, so we, um, Finally, Morgan said we should probably keep walking before the police get on our tail. So we were walking and then I had a total nervous breakdown and blamed Morgan for everything. I said, you stabbed her. You wanted to do this. Look at what Morgan did then. Morgan's not one to cry very often. Mm-hmm. And then finally she just let go and started crying. And then, or I just needed to vent because I was scared. Mm-hmm. What's intriguing here is seeing how the girl's self-preservation instincts far overruled any concern they might have had for Peyton's well-being. Anissa is about to name two reasons why she was scared, but neither have anything to do with what state Peyton might be in. I was scared. I'm just... I was scared, A, for myself, and B, for my family, because um, after we left Peyton in the woods, um, close to the Mercy area, that was nearby, she said, oh, and there was one thing I forgot to tell you, I kind of sort of made a deal with Slender to say that if I didn't, say that if we didn't kill, uh, Bella, that he would, he was either would or could kill our families and everything we love, and I don't want that to happen, so that's why I did this. What Anissa just said would later become very important. Prosecutors would latch onto this statement that suggests Anissa only had the fear of her family being hurt after the stabbing to argue that this scenario was never kill or be killed in her mind. A deputy district attorney would assert that in truth, Anissa went along with the murder plot because she was desperate to keep Morgan's friendship and said it was therefore a choice she needed to be held criminally responsible for. And then I got really scared then and started like 
speed walking and trying to get myself out of there, I even started like sticking to myself to kind of calm myself down. One thing that never seems to have crossed Morgan or Anissa's minds as they got further and further from the scene of their crime was any conflicted feeling over the possibility that they could go back and help their victim. And then, um, I said, stop crying. I laid down and, like, um, there was a bunch of rocks close to the road. Um, it was, like, it's called a shoulder or something. Mm-hmm. So I was laying down there, and Morgan thought I was giving up and letting, like, the hawks and everything go after me. Anissa says she told Morgan to stop crying, that she was laying down there to cool off as she was too hot. But then she decided she didn't want to risk getting malaria from the mosquitoes there, and so they kept walking. When I was still laying on the ground, um, I, I actually said, I've had enough of this. I want to call my mom. I want to go home. <laughs> and Morgan said, if you do that, you'll spend your life in prison. Either that or be executed. Why did she find she said that? Because she told me that... Um, the consequences for murder were being murdered yourself, I believe. When did she tell you that? Um, after I said I wanted to call my mom. So what did you think was going to happen after you stabbed uh, Peyton? I don't really know. I figured that I'd get in trouble eventually, though. Because, um, Mommy always says that whatever you do catches up to you eventually. And it did. Morgan continues to demonstrate a complete lack of emotional connection to this crime. You guys think about what would happen to you? I did. Anissa didn't seem to think anyone thing would happen. One time she said, can we go home yet? And I said, no, we're going to get arrested if we go home. And then she said, oh yeah, I forgot. Thanks, Morgan. And then I said, okay. Although we can't be sure if Morgan's story here really happened, since she's inherently an unreliable source, Anissa asking if they could go home already would only build on the idea that this plot may have felt almost make-believe in her mind. She likely got swept up in the fantasy of running away to live with the character she'd been reading so much about. But in the back of her mind, she may have still held on to the wishful thinking that she'd be able to go home and eat dinner with her family like nothing happened. Finally, Anissa described the moments that led up to them getting caught. She started looking through her pictures and had her mother break down. Okay. So then, um, and then after like 30 minutes of me trying to calm her down and her crying, we, um, we finally um, started walking again. And then we kept walking straight for a while. And then we saw Steinhoff open and I said it. They went into the furniture store to refill their water bottles and grab some extra fruit snacks for the road. They then went outside and sat by a tree. Morgan started contemplating on whether or not we should face our consequences or keep going. So then I laid down on the grass and that's when one of the deputies said, put your hands in the air where I can see them. And then they got us. Okay. When he started talking to me, I said, I'm scared. I was told. I was told that if I didn't do something for someone, my family would be in danger. And then she said, you're safe now, don't be scared. But she put me in the back of the car, and then I watched Morgan. I don't know what I said to her, because I couldn't hear anything. Right. And then after, like, 30 minutes, they brought us here. Okay. Okay. Four hours and 30 minutes after Peyton was found, at approximately 2.30 p.m., Morgan and Anissa were apprehended on the intersection of Highway 164 and Interstate 94. A good Samaritan driving by had seen a post on Facebook, spreading the word to look out for the two girls on the run. They recognized them immediately before calling 911, tracking their movements, and relaying the information to authorities. When the girls settled down to take a break, The police arrived and intercepted them soon after. The officer drew his sidearm at the girls and ordered them to put their hands in the air, to which they complied. The girls were soaked in blood, but things were about to get even more disturbing. 
Morgan's reaction to the officers was utterly bizarre, and it was clear that she was either detached from reality or putting on some sort of act. As more officers arrived on the scene, Morgan asked, did I kill her? Is she dead? Police found the backpack Morgan had packed that morning and began to dig through, finding food, water bottles, the five-inch kitchen knife, and Morgan and Anissa's family photos. As the officers were observing the blood stains on Morgan's clothing, they asked her where the blood had come from. She replied that she was forced to kill her best friend. While the authorities waited for custody to be transferred to Waukesha Police Department, an officer asked Morgan what she was thinking. Morgan explained that she was thinking about Spock, the Star Trek character, and his girlfriend. The officer was obviously caught off guard and asked her to explain further, and she elaborated that Spock and his girlfriend were gross, as Spock could not feel emotion, and he apparently should not be kissing a woman. Once apprehended, Morgan began to softly sing to herself. When she was placed into the rear of the squad car, she stated, What, are you gonna f***ing execute me for killing her? What do you think should happen to somebody that stabs somebody else? I'm fucking glad you either get put in some sort of a weird place, or I expected that you either get put in prison or an insane asylum. I didn't know what to expect. I don't think I'm insane now. One type of delusion is a grandiose one, in which a person develops an overinflated sense of power or knowledge and may believe they have a great talent. You'll see this manifested in Morgan's next statement. You ever thought about hurting yourself? I can make myself known to be on command. What does that mean? Vulcan mind tricks. So you ever tried to hurt yourself? The interrogator asks about self-harm, clearly looking to elicit additional symptoms of her mental disease. Not really. Sometimes they do. What do you mean? Most of the time it's not even on purpose. What do you mean hurt yourself? Oh, I just fall down the stairs a lot and sometimes I just like do, do this and I accidentally like do this instead of this or something. Schizophrenia is debilitating in many ways, and psychomotor problems can also be a symptom, including clumsiness and unusual mannerisms, which could be the underlying cause of the ways Morgan says she accidentally hurts herself. So you guess that about hurting anybody else, or just that long? Uh, sometimes I need to slap people in the face for no reason, like me. How about stabbing people? You ever thought about stabbing anybody else? Only jokingly. <sighs> not seriously thought about it. So not really or not seriously? Not really. I wanted to hurt people before, but they're not nice to me, so they deserve it. But well, Bella's nice to you. Why did you want to hurt her? Because I, it was necessary. Well, I don't know. Her thinking is disorganized on the topic of why it was necessary to kill Peyton, once more demonstrating the symptom of disorganized or disconnected thoughts. In their interrogations, the girls were asked about the specifics of how long they'd been planning this murder, which will of course go to determining premeditation. Morgan's interrogator would later emphasize, it wasn't until we started talking with the girls that we really knew it was two 12-year-old girls that had planned for six months to kill their friend. So you've known, you're very close with Morgan. Um, you've known her since October. You've been involved in, in reading the creepy pasta since, you know, like November or something. And in December or January, um, Morgan, who also is into creepy pasta, did you introduce her to it or did she already know about it? Um, she said that she's seen Slender also in, like, old pictures that she has. Okay. So I told her about them, and then she said, oh my god, I think I, see, I, think I, I saw Slender when I was, like, five, because she supposedly used to live in, like, a really heavily wooded area. Okay. Um, Slender likes to stay in woods. Wooded area. Okay. A shared psychotic disorder, also known as folie adieu, or madness of two, 
occurs when a person starts to take on the delusions of someone with a psychotic disorder such as schizophrenia. It's a rare phenomenon, but this unlucky friendship created a cycle wherein the girls would only feed into, validate, and strengthen one another's false beliefs and determination. So in December and January, uh, Morgan approaches you and says, um, she tells you um, that you should be proxies of slender or puppets. And she, you say, okay, well, how do we do that? And she says, well, we have to kill Bella or Kate. Right. And this will prove ourselves to slender. Prove ourselves worthy. Prove yourself worthy to slender. Mm -hmm. It's truly fascinating how different both girls' understanding of their plan was. Anissa is saying that Morgan told her explicitly that they had to kill Peyton to become proxies, while Morgan still can't even put a finger on why Anissa supposedly said it was necessary. It seems that groupthink, or the desire for cohesion and consensus outweighing the desire to make the right decision, may have played a big role here. If either girl started coming to their senses or having doubts about whether or not they should go through with trying to murder their friend, they may have kept it bottled up in order to be a good friend and not upset their partner. There may also be pluralistic ignorance at play here, in which each girl believed that the other held more extreme beliefs than themselves about the matter. This could have caused both girls to go along with the scheme, thinking that their partner was completely gung-ho about it while both secretly held reservations and privately disagreed with many aspects of the plan. However, the more we hear from Anissa and Morgan, the harder it becomes to tell who, if anyone, was the true leader of this operation. And what would that do for you? Does that take it slender to like you? Or to well, feel technically, if you're a proxy, you have to live in... Um, Supposedly, you live in Slender Mansion. Oh. Take orders directly from him. So that'd be, that'd be neat to you. You would enjoy that, or you think that's mm -hmm. kind of cool? For at the time? It was, that was, at the time, it was really cool. Okay. But I, again, I wanted to prove all skeptics wrong. Okay. Morgan and Anissa were completely swept up into a fantasy world. And with the lines between reality and fantasy beginning to blur, Things were becoming incredibly dangerous. In the months before their plan, Morgan and Anissa's internet activity took a dark turn. Morgan began searching phrases such as how to cover up a murder, what makes your conscience feel guilty about killing someone or homicides, what kind of insane am I, and what happens if I get caught murdering someone. Among other searches such as Slenderman Cute, can you get arrested for killing someone in self-defense, proxy the Slenderman Wiki, and how to cover up a murder slash YouTube. Morgan would actually go on to curiously ask her interrogator about self-defense as well. Isn't it legal to stab someone if they try to stab you first? If it's self-defense? Uh, in some situations. But do you think that that's what happened here? Oh no, I'm just wondering. On May 10th, Morgan had emailed Anissa, delete everything I've ever sent you and then clear your deleted email. You will not be emailed further on this subject. Explain more at school. Yeah, and when was it planned that you were going to kill uh, Bella? Did you plan right away when you, were planning, when you guys were planning a birthday party? Or? No, Morgan said um, around the end of December, beginning of January, um, again, the hey, I don't know how we can become proxies, we have to kill Bella. Okay. Um, so I said, and then um, after I was wondering when, so I asked her when, and she was like, oh, every year that my mom said that for my birthday, I can have two friends over, and it's definitely going to be a sleepover. Do you always have a sleepover? Um, I did last year, too. It was more fun last year, though, obviously. Anissa claims that the two only met the previous October, meaning their friendship would have only been growing for about two months before they began to plan a murder together. Was there anything said about trying to become a proxy or being a proxy at that time? Uh, we kind of talked about it discreetly on the bus every now and then. And what did you talk about? Like, um... Ways to defend ourselves 
themselves from like wild animals and all that, like badgers and um, just random things we might need to know. It was like if you live in the woods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Did you ever talk about killing Bella in the bus at the birthday party? Uh, not very often. We did sometimes, but we made sure we whispered. And when you whispered, why was that? So that nobody else would hear. Granted, the bus is really loud, but yeah. people are eavesdroppers. If somebody heard, what were you concerned if somebody heard? That we would be in prison for the rest of our life for doing this. Did you know it's wrong? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. The interrogator is looking for ways to corroborate the story, such as interviewing other students who regularly took the bus. This is a standard police investigation method. Anissa's admission that they whispered in order to avoid getting in serious trouble indicates awareness and understanding of the wrongness of their plan at that point in time. Legally, insanity may come and go, and courts will consider sanity both at the time of the crime as well as before and after. When does it ultimately come to um, the decision that it's going to happen at the birthday party? Um, that was made in February when Morgan said, I confirmed with my mom of having a birthday party. We used code words like for knife, we meant we used cracker. For the killing, we would use words like it, the deed. Um, for the place we were trying to go, they thought we would use, like, camping trip and all that. Up north, camping trip. These code words show significant planning and surreptitious behavior, which goes towards establishing knowledge of guilt. The girls might have used code words and whispered, but in reality, they were not the only people who knew of their plan. Following the crime, investigators spoke with local students and school staff, and that's where they uncovered some truly shocking information. A few weeks before the stabbing occurred, one concerned girl had come forward to let an adult know that Anissa was claiming she had found a way to become a proxy for Slender Man and needed to kill someone as part of that plan. It was believed that the guidance counselors at Morgan and Anissa's middle school were also aware of this. Officers tracked down the counselor who the student was reported to have confided in about her worries with Anissa. However, the woman claimed she couldn't recall ever being approached about such a matter. However, a social worker who was employed at Morgan and Anissa's middle school at the time of the incident did reveal that a student had later come to her expressing feelings of guilt. Why? Because she said Anissa had asked her to be part of the stabbing before it occurred. She felt ashamed that she had this knowledge and hadn't done something about it. One girl, who was actually a junior in high school, told authorities Anissa was her best friend and that the two had enjoyed talking about creepy and dark things. This friend also remembers Anissa saying she had discovered that killing a friend would allow her to become Slender Man's proxy. But at the time, the girl says she just dismissed it as a goofy thing. One classmate would later testify in court that Anissa had hinted about killing a friend, but then assured her, don't worry, it's not you. It's disturbing and unfortunate just how many people knew about Morgan and Anissa's dark plan, but didn't take their words seriously enough until it was far too late. Here, the girls describe what their original plan was. So originally, it was, I thought it was um, we go to around 8, where we set the alarm on her Kindle to like 2 a.m. and puts the headphones on and then the alarm wakes her up. She wakes me up and then um, we kill Bella, put her under some covers, make it look like she was sleeping and then we run. Then just leave her at Morgan's house. <laughs> That was the original plan? Yeah, until it changed. We were still planning on waking up really early, but Morgan was being really nice that day, and um, she let me sleep in like an extra two hours and 45 minutes. On that day, meaning today? Um, on what day? At the sleepover okay. uh, last night. So she was being nice, what do you mean? Um, 
Sometimes she could be kind of mean, but that's only like when she's threatened. I thought we were going to Skateland the next day. Okay. But we were in reality going to Skateland that night. And so that messed up the timeline? Mm -hmm. For me it did. Did you originally make that first plan? Is that why? She made the first plan. I just kind of went along with it and tweaked some things. Okay. What was your plan originally when you guys were going to kill Bella? Do it only while she was sleeping so we didn't have to look in her eyes. How are you doing your sleep? I don't know. It didn't work out very well, obviously. What do you mean? Meaning, we couldn't have... Well, actually, Anissa was very prepared to go with it, but... So who was prepared to go with it, Anissa? Anissa was very prepared to do it that night, but then... Who was that last night? Yeah. <coughs> I found many flaws in her plan, such as the fact of exhaustion. I know how she is with her sleep. It would never have worked. It didn't work this time, obviously, and we're never going to try again because I hope I never have to see Anissa again. Many of the things Morgan chooses to say about Anissa suggests a feeling that Anissa is beneath her in some way. And here, with her harsh statement that she hopes she never has to see Anissa again, just hours after planning to run away with her forever, we can see just how fast she was able to turn against her friends, further illustrating her difficulty with maintaining healthy social relationships. So what were you guys originally going to do? You know, when she was sleeping, how were you going to do that? Do the same way we did now, except we probably duct tape her mouth shut or something. I don't know. Whichever way would be the most logical, if there's any logic in killing people, which I don't think there is, actually. So if you guys were duct tape, do you guys have duct tape? Actually, it worked out quite well. Well, I got me duct tape for my birthday, and he was like, ooh, and I was like, he said it won't work like that. Because she doesn't understand the, what it does to you psychologically when you don't get any sleep, and what the guilt can do to you that you will nevertheless have constantly underlying if you kill someone, both of which mixed together would cause a mental breakdown. Even when considering the lifelong guilt attached with murder, Morgan remains cold, calculating, and logistical in her evaluation. I never really did think that that plan would work because it is the dead of nine. How on earth are we supposed to do anything such as hide the body? So I didn't think it would work personally. I thought so you're the originally crazy. the plan was to duct tape and stab her, but you didn't think it was a good idea? Mm -hmm. I thought that we just make a lot of noise. Blah, 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 blah. Because you can still scream if your mouth is shut, shut, cut, like smiling. I definitely still scream because one time in like first grade I talked with my mouth closed a lot. I sort of didn't want it to be today though because it would be nice to have a normal sleepover. For Peyton, everything did seem normal at first. And that just makes the whole thing even more disturbing. She says as the trio skated together at the roller rink and ate frozen yogurt, she never had any idea of the insidious plan they were hiding. The only thing that was odd in hindsight was that she noticed Morgan wanted to go to bed early, whereas at all of their past sleepovers, she would always want to stay up all night. But of course, such a small deviation in behavior could never have tipped Peyton off to what was really going on. I honestly don't know why we did this. When Morgan says, I don't know why we did this, this might actually be a truthful statement. If the crime was conceived during episodes of psychosis, the real Morgan may not have any knowledge or understanding of what the psychosis Morgan was thinking or saying or doing during those episodes. Morgan describes that she actually didn't set the alarm which was supposed to wake her up through headphones and instigate their plan to attack in the middle of the night. I took Denise into falling asleep, telling her that I'd wake up two more hours so that she could kill Bella. I wanted to give her at least one more morning. So you were supposed to set the alarm for 2.30 a.m.? Um, I didn't. You said Denise was mad when she woke up? 
Yeah, very good and sleepy and stuff. But she wasn't happy either. So how would you describe her? When you... Oh, more again, again. Disappointed? Mm-hmm. Being disappointed is good work, you? Yes. What's strange about this is you'll recall that Anissa framed it very differently. She thought Morgan was being nice that morning by allowing her to sleep in, which is obviously very different from Morgan's claim that Anissa was frustrated and disappointed with the failed plan. And I didn't think it would work. I didn't think any of this would work from the start. Things like this never work out. From what I've read and heard and... You wanted to give Bella one more day? I wanted to see if I could put it off forever, but it didn't seem to work out like that. So... Interestingly, Anissa also claimed that she wanted to put the crime off for a while. Morgan then said, we have to kill Bella today. And I was like, but can't we stay another night and do it tonight? Because I was still kind of scared and kind of hopeful. Scared and kind of hopeful, what do you mean? Like, I was scared because A, I would never see my family again. Mm -hmm. And um, B, I was kind of hopeful to prove that I wasn't crazy, that I wasn't, that I wasn't seeing things. Because even I saw the weather a few times. Okay. And I think I was just, that was probably my mind playing trick coming. When did you, when was this before the party that you saw yeah. the You've seen him before? Twice. Um, once, well, they were both on a bus. We ride the same bus to stand to from school. So we were, uh, like, talking on the bus. I look out the window, and I see this, uh, supposed thing standing like this with tendrils, looks exactly like a tree, um, they were going like that. Claiming that she saw Slenderman before is a major reality disconnect. And, um, I told Morgan, and so I actually thought that he was real, because I saw him. After Morgan finishes explaining their plan A, the interrogator goes back to get more details about the act they actually ended up carrying out. But Morgan seems once again impatient with the repeated query. What did you do next? I already told you. What was that? Stab, 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 stab. Did you try to stab her before that? No. Did you just go to the park? Yes. What happened at the park? In the park. We played, and she went on the swing, and I was in the bathroom. What happened in the bathroom? I was singing. Socially, this type of response may be typical for a frustrated and immature person. But as Morgan has already given this answer multiple times under similar circumstances, it is unclear why she chooses now to get snappy. So then after the bathroom, did you go down? I already told you. Where is that? Over by the trees at the dead end. And what did you do there? Stabby, stab, 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 stab. Hide and seek. What's that? I already told you. Her repeated utterances of just simply stab, 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 stab might be indicative of thought blocking. Morgan is being asked to repeat her story which is a common interrogation tactic, but to her, it is an annoyance, as if she has better things to be doing. And then Anissa did the jumpy thing and said, now more. What do you mean the jumpy thing? She jumped on Bella. You know what happened? What? What happened then? And then we stabbed her. She even goes so far as to ask this bold question. And then I went and looked for them. You know what happened? Then I found them. You know what happened? Tried to play again. And then Anissa jumped on Bella again. Like I just said. 
You know what happened? Are you trying to do this over and over again and see if I tell the story differently? I'm just trying to make sure that I get it right, that I don't want to make any mistakes. So then she jumped on her, and where did you get the knife from? The bag. So you took the knife out of the bag? Mm-hmm. And then what? Morgan has also been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, which entails a frequent and persistent pattern of anger, irritability, arguing, defiance, or vindictiveness towards peers, parents, teachers, and other authority figures. And then she got stabbed. Who stabbed her? Both of us. Who stabbed her first? How am I supposed to remember that? No, this is just pretty important, so I'm just gotta try to kind of concentrate. Anissa or me, one of the two, of course, but I don't know. What this illustrates is a typical symptom of schizophrenia called a deficit in social cognition. There is a lack of appropriate processing in social interactions and relationships. Morgan certainly has many moments of getting frustrated with the interrogator. Did you have anything first, or did she... Did I have the right not to go into detail about it if I don't want to. Okay. Before you said you didn't remember, you remember you just don't want to tell me? I don't really remember. It happened really, really fast. How many times do you think it was? I don't know. I didn't know it was supposed to count. How many do you think? Like one or two or five or know. ten? Fifty? hundred? I don't know. I think she'd be dead if it was a hundred. However, there are also moments like this where we can see just a bit of Morgan appearing to struggle with the morality of what she's done. I'm sorry for bringing you through all this trouble, sir. No, no, you know, I'm trying to do this. I think that you need some help, somebody to talk to, and try to work out some of these things that you got going on. What do you mean? Well, thinking about, what does he call this guy? Mr. Slim? Slenderman? Slenderman. I mean, those thoughts probably aren't real. And to think about stabbing one of your very good friends probably isn't the best thoughts to be having. To get a better idea of just how extreme Morgan's disease is, schizophrenia symptoms usually begin in late adolescence or early adulthood, making an onset younger than the age of 18 uncommon and a diagnosis before 13 extraordinarily rare. Estimates claim that at the very most, only one in every 100 adult schizophrenia patients developed it while still a child. Are you? Uh, probably not. So you know that that's wrong to do, right? Yes, no, maybe. But people have, lots of people have seen on your man. But how about that is your friend? you think that's right or wrong? Probably wrong. If it were right, I wouldn't be here. That's right. You can't go around stabbing people, so that's why I think that maybe you gotta get to talk to somebody to get some of these things work out so you don't go around doing this anymore. But the question is, deep down, did the girls truly believe that Slender Man was going to target them if they didn't do this? At a few moments in the interrogations, we can garner a little insight into their headspace. When Morgan said to you, that if, if we don't do this for Slender, um, our families are and loved ones are going to be killed. Do you honestly believe that? Well, yeah, because he could be anywhere from 6 feet to 14 feet tall. He's, like I said, a tall guy who constantly wears a suit with a red tie. Um, he doesn't have a face. His skin is white. And um, at his own will, he can, um, like, exploit these tendrils from his back and, uh, like, strangle his victims from all the creepy pasta. He said he targets children most. And so I was really scared, knowing that Slender could easily kill my whole family in three seconds. So when, how did you learn about Slender and creepy pasta? Um, I first heard about it on YouTube. I was watching a Minecraft mod showcase by Sky... Uh, 
Okay. He got his blood craft or something. Okay. And it said it, he, it was the creepy pasta bot. So I was like, hey, what's a creepy pasta? I watched the whole video and I was like, oh, that's interesting. A few months later, I asked my friend Kelly, the one who I got the skull bracelet from. Okay. I asked her um, what who that Jack or Jeff or killer was from the creepy pasta. And she told me about I Love Jack and Laughing Jack. Laughing Jack is supposed to be um, like a clown that also targets children. And then um, I Love Jack, he wears a blue fawn mask, no mouth, um, two big black holes for eyes that are like oozing this weird black ooze. And then um, supposedly he eats Human wow. The interrogator plays along with the bizarre fantasy, giving understanding O's here and there. Although we can't be sure if Anissa truly believes this story or is trying to appear disconnected with reality as a part of her defense, she does retain eye contact and consistent body language that she's had this whole time, which suggests she's telling the truth, at least as she perceives it. Whenever I'm really bored, I go on my iPad and I look up, go to the creepy pasta with you. Mm-hmm. And then there's um, a button you can click for a random pasta. Mm-hmm. So I read whichever random one comes up. And, and so in reading these, you truly believe that slender exists, that there's slender out there. In Not your anymore because. Um, we like asked for his help when Morgan and I were having nervous breakdowns and he didn't do anything. Nothing happened. Before this day, leading up to and so, even after. Um, you... While we were walking and having a nervous breakdown while I was laying on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, Morgan said, Slender, if you're listening, please help us. And he says having a nervous breakdown. And um, then she started kind of crying. That you truly believe before before yeah, beforehand, anyway. I believe, but that's now I know that it's just teenagers. Okay. Mm-hmm. Really like scaring people. And making them believe false things. Okay. It's interesting to note how Anissa claims to now realize she was being fooled about the existence of Slenderman. If she had believed in the lore so deeply that she was willing to partake in the murder of her friend. Would she really be able to change all her preconceptions about the matter in the span of just this day? Was this traumatic experience enough to snap her out of it? The only other options would seem to be that she either never really believed in it in the first place, or she secretly still believes in it now. Who's this uh, creepy guy that you're talking about? Hi, John. <laughs> Is it slim or slender or something? Slenderman. man. who is that? He's very tall. Have you ever met him? Not exactly. Tell me about him. He watches you. How does he watch you? He can read minds and he has teleportation skills. Morgan's mother would later reveal that Morgan had been experiencing visual hallucinations since three years old, one being a tall, slender, shadowy figure. She believes this early influence was what ultimately solidified Morgan's later belief in the existence of Slender Man. Did you see him in your dreams, or where did you see him at? Oh, I've seen him in my dreams. (laughs) You start to get um, something that people call Slender Sickness. If um, he's like following you or if you meet him because of the stigma radiation that he emits. Which is also like cameras don't work around me. Why do you guys know about Slender Man? Because I think Slender Man might have something to do with, with what's going on with you today. Oh. Did you feel bad? Did you stab one of your best friends? I thought about it, but then I decided that remorse will get me nowhere. It's easier to live without regrets than you can just decide that you don't want to feel. Oh, don't you? Don't do it. Just, when you, you, don't you rather not feel things if you don't? It's a negative emotion, what's the point of feeling it? 
So you don't have to do it again or just stay away from it or make different choices? All right. I can't do it again. Of course not. Of course, if something's bad, then you don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so when she said that, that, that we have to kill uh, Bella to prove ourselves worthy to slender, um, you were surprised but excited mm -hmm. at the same time to prove that he existed, that, to mm -hmm. prove all the skeptics wrong. <laughs> and um, and did you and you feel as though you, in order to do this, you physically had to kill somebody? Yes. Okay. The interrogator confirms that Anissa actually believed they had to kill someone. This is an intent question as to whether or not the suspect believed they merely had to pretend to do something, negating intent, or actually had concluded they needed to do it and had resolved to go through with the act, intent more likely confirmed. Many of these queries are trying to establish if Anissa formed the necessary mens rea, or state of mind, to be part of a murder plot. Mens rea refers to criminal intent, and can be translated to guilty mind. We're looking at if the defendant committed the offense with a culpable state of mind. That's what creepypastas are about. Okay. Even seemingly nice creepypastas, like me that keeps me calm, are about killing. And do you know what happens when you kill somebody? Like, are you physically what happens to a person? Not, not legally, but like, like, what would that do to you? Like, do you understand what it means to kill somebody? The interrogator asks if Anissa knows what it means to kill someone, probing at her mental state and ability to comprehend the gravity of the crime. When you look at it from, you know, I believe it's ending a life. At this point, Anissa has stopped crying and lost the outward appearance of emotional upset. Perhaps she is just becoming numb, or alternatively, it could be a representation of a pathology of narcissism or sociopathy. A Democrat. And that's something you probably recognize today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I've seen stories on the news about shootings in like Milwaukee and all that, but I never fully understood what it meant to kill somebody until now. Until you saw it happening. Mm -hmm. Saying that she never understood what it meant to kill until she saw it happening really sounds like a juvenile mind at play here. But sociopathy, along with other mental diseases, can manifest at a very early age. Do you think that you could be able to physically do that now? No. And why is that? Just I'm too nice of a person. I mean, I'm too nice and too squeamish. Squeamish. Like, I can stand blood if it's my own, but if I have to physically make someone else bleed for my personal gain, I won't do it. It just doesn't sit right with me. Now, since this happened? Yeah. Okay. Anissa thinks she is too nice of a person to kill someone. This is a fascinating disassociation from the recent attempted killing. Her mental state at this point seems to be bouncing between clarity and understanding, all the way to nonsensical denials of reality, which is not uncommon with juveniles. I didn't want to do this. What did you do then? I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't. Psychosis with persecution seems to be presenting itself here. Delusions of persecution make someone convinced that someone is mistreating, conspiring against, or planning to harm them or their loved ones. These obsessions can grow to disrupt a person's ability to live a normal, everyday life, as it clearly has with Morgan. These false beliefs can range from highly improbable, such as fear of neighbors spying on you, to completely irrational, such as believing in something paranormal like Slender Man. Since hallucinations are closely tied with these delusions, it's no surprise that Morgan's supposed sightings of the creepy man only stoked her fear more. And as we saw earlier with Morgan's comments about being left to rot and die in jail and not wanting her head cut off, her delusions of persecution extend to real-world authority figures as well. So you said that you were afraid? Mm -hmm. What were you afraid of? Pretty much anything. 
Being afraid of pretty much anything is a classic persecution symptom associated with schizophrenia. Because I'm used to her already, like, just out of her house, hoping that we would let her and think she could forget that. That you would forget? I need that. She thought it was just like, now kitty, and I was like, oh my goodness, no. And I don't know what would have happened because Bella would have freaked out, and then Anissa would have freaked out at me, and then they would all be mad at me. And, um, I didn't want to get hurt. You didn't want to get hurt? Mm -hmm. Did you think about how Bella would feel if she get hurt? I avoided that thought. Anissa said something about us having to. Avoiding thoughts about how the victim would feel is a common disassociation presentation among the mentally ill. As both girls' interrogations wind to a close, there are a few more interesting elements to touch on. In Anissa's case, one of the most intriguing moments happens right towards the end. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Where is Bella's body now? Bella's a basketball. Okay. Um, I thought it was still out there. The crime scene. Did you think that she died? Yeah. She is alive. Okay. This curiosity is so interesting. And when Anissa learns that Peyton is still alive, her sigh of what seems to be relief may be a notion of remorse. Although it is hard to tell from this single indicator. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel kind of happy. Kind of worried, but like I'm just scared all around. What are you worried about? I know she'll never trust me again, and that she hates my dad. Yeah. Well, that's pretty yeah. pretty serious. What happened? She was very very close to dying. Oh, today. Okay. Very close. The doctors were able to save her. Okay. How does that make you feel? Good. Makes you feel good that she's alive? Mm -hmm. She may be starting to grasp the severity of her circumstances now, but it's hard to gauge when taking her immature and possibly mentally ill mind into account. Well, are you able to go back to school? Um, what day is it today? Saturday? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to go back to school on Monday. But at some point in time, you'll be able to go back to school. Okay. Okay. How many stab wounds did they find? 19. Okay. Well, you counted 17. Was she counting out loud as she was doing it? No, she was counting in her head, I think. Are my clothes being cut apart? No. Okay. They're being dried to ensure that blood is dry on it. Okay. Okay. Um, it can also be a biohazard. Right? Oh. Okay. I just realized something. Mm -hmm. If I don't go to school on Monday, that'll be the first day I miss a school. A day of school. You're kidding. You've never missed a day of school. Never. The last time I remember missing a day of school was because of my great-grandfather's funeral. Wow. But that was in third grade. Anissa is still worried about kid stuff despite a very adult crime on her hands. It's safe to say she has no idea how much serious trouble she is in at this point. Am I ever going to get my clothes back? I don't know if you're going to get those clothes back. I don't know if you want those clothes back. Do you want those clothes back? I mean, you can have them. You probably can have them back some point in time. Oh, yeah, they have the blood on it and stuff. I don't know, but it doesn't make me feel a lot better knowing that she's alive. Good. Does it worry you won't she thunder? Or do you think he does not exist? He does not exist. He is a work of fiction. And I believe that people who say that they've seen him in person um, have um, read creepypastas 
And then we call them the wreaths of a strange tree. This one said it was slender. Because I know that was one of the cases on the bus. I looked back at the tree and it was strange. Did Morgan know that Bella was alive? Um, I don't know. I don't know if Detective Casey told her. Oh, you know. And were you were you hoping that she was gonna die when you guys ran off? Were you hoping she was gonna die and she could see slender? Was that the whole part of me kind of wanted them to fail just because I'm I hear about manslaughter and all that on TV and it doesn't bother bother me much, but when I see it, it traumatizes me. Mm. But the other part of me wanted her to die. But part of me wanted to, the bad part of me wanted her to die. But the good part of me wanted her to live. Conflicted feeling between one's good side and bad side could be a precursor of schizophrenic behavior. But it's only a subtle potential indicator at this point. It was scary for her um, where she was stabbed was near the heart. Um, they did have to go in and incision and open up her chest and sew part of her heart to repair it. Okay. And then after that, they had to open up her stomach because her pancreas was cut. Um, a part of her liver was cut and so her stomach. Yeah, Mariel said she got her in the stomach. So those were very serious injuries. And she was... Um, she was very near to death. So what you guys were trying to accomplish today um, was very close to happening. Okay. Um, but the doctors were able to fix her. And um, what about the big gash on her leg right there? Um, I'm sure they were going to be able to sew that up. There's no major artery in the leg right there. Okay, but then you get closer to your, to your pelvic, pelvic, pelvic bone. Um, but yeah, this is, this is pretty serious and I know that you were worried about, you know, execution and stuff like that. We, we don't have the death penalty in this country. Okay. You're 12 years old. I'm not, I'm, I'm honest with you, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen here. Okay. Okay. Um, something horrific happened today. And I know you realize that now. I regret it. Okay. And, um, and, but we've got to. Uh, accept some responsibility here. Mm -hmm. and, and by giving me that statement, you're accepting some responsibility. You, you're very honest with me and you cooperated with me. And that means a lot. That means a lot to me. Okay. From Anissa's calm demeanor, it's apparent that reality hasn't settled in yet. Even when the interrogator finally reads her story back to her and asks if anything is incorrect or if she missed anything, Anissa feels it is important to add more information about another creepy pasta character. Could you add um, that Slenderman and Dalgo have coffee? Dalgo? Yes. How do you spell Dalgo? D A L G O. Dalgo also has a proxy? Mm -hmm. Has proxies? Yes. Is Dalgo like Slenderman? Um, he's supposed to be this demon with seven mouths. Oh, the, the demon. Mm -hmm. okay. So what I just read to you was the statement that, you know, that is written here. Um, Morgan is compliant as her interview ends and she is handcuffed. In the aftermath of this crime, officers found a message written on the notepad of Anissa's phone. It was from May 28th and read, my final wish to those who care, do not grieve my absence, but remember me for who I was. I love and cherish you all and wouldn't do you harm. I want everything I own to go to my parents and best wishes to all that know me personally. Do not miss me. Recovering notebooks from Anissa and Morgan's lockers at school revealed drawings that appear to show bloody figures, characters holding knives and slender man sketches. Emails between two addresses called Hermione G516 and Alexandria Wire were also recovered, exchanging furtive messages like, make sure not to leave any traces because when said events happen, the school will search your email. And I told myself not to feel emotions and it worked. One which appeared to be from Anissa read, but clever girls dressed to kill are bittersweet. 
I think that may be us. Peyton was interviewed after recovering, and although she gave authorities many details on what had happened to her, when asked what Morgan did to her specifically, she replied, I can't say it, it's too sad. She revealed that Morgan whispered, I'm so sorry to her, before starting. She claims Morgan told her it was the only way to save Peyton's life because one of the creepypasta characters was stalking her. Peyton told Morgan she doubted it, but Morgan said, we're not joking. To this day, Peyton is left with emotional scars that will affect her for the rest of her life. For months after the attack, she slept with scissors under her pillow for protection, and she keeps her bedroom windows closed and locked, refusing to open the curtains just in case. She was excited to return to school that same September, eager to get back into a normal routine after working to recover from the traumatic event. Her community rallied together, wearing purple to honor her favorite color and raising thousands of dollars to help cover her medical expenses. Morgan and Anissa were charged in adult court with first-degree attempted intentional homicide. Morgan pleaded guilty and was convicted, but as part of an agreement was found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Anissa pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of being a party to attempted second-degree intentional homicide, but she was eventually found by a jury to be not guilty by mental disease or defect. Psychologists agree that Morgan and Anissa's friendship created a perfect storm of shared delusion. It was revealed that Morgan's father had suffered from a similar mental illness as his daughter when he was an adolescent and was hospitalized at least four times, showing that Morgan's early onset schizophrenia may have had a genetic basis. Doctors testified in 2014 that she believed she had Vulcan mind control abilities, could speak to Voldemort, that unicorns and pegasuses were real, and that she could communicate with not only Slender Man, but also the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. In the recent years, her mental health has reportedly seen significant improvements. Still, at one point, a state psychologist told the judge that she would not support Morgan being granted a conditional release, as she had been hearing the voice of Maggie, a hallucinatory voice she has been hearing for years again. Anissa was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and personality disorder. Her defense argued that she was under the command and control of a delusional disorder linked to schizotypy, a diminished ability to separate reality from fantasy. Although no apology will ever be able to erase what Peyton endured, it's interesting to note that both girls have expressed that they are sorry for what they did. Anissa was sentenced to 25 years, and Morgan the maximum of 40 in a mental health institution. However, in the summer of 2021, there has been a recent update to this case. A judge agreed to a petition for conditional release from Anissa, which argued that the 19-year-old young woman is no longer a threat to herself or society. Based on hospital staff's reports that Anissa didn't exhibit psychotic behaviors, it's been ordered that state officials produce her release plan, and she was scheduled a hearing on September 10th. In a letter to the court, she asserted that she has exhausted the resources available to her at the mental health institution and needs to rejoin society in order to become a productive member of it. And when the anticipated day of the hearing finally arrived, a Wisconsin judge ruled that Anissa would indeed be granted her release from the psychiatric hospital on September 13th. The full report on her conditions of release has not been released to the public, but the judge has stated that Anissa had a clean mental health history, and that there is no clear evidence that she poses a substantial risk of harm to others or herself. Anissa herself informed the court that she plans to live with her father and look for part-time work. She will remain under constant GPS monitoring until otherwise determined. She also hopes to pursue higher education. She's expressed, I want to reiterate that I'm not saying I'm done growing, changing, evolving, or adapting. I just can't do it here anymore. Reports indicate that she will be under strict regulations, such as not being allowed to use the internet except at home, and any time she does use it, her activity will be monitored by the State Department of Corrections. She won't be able to consume alcohol or drugs, enter a bar, possess a weapon, or have any contact with Peyton or her family. Peyton has expressed that she doesn't have fear of what might happen upon her attacker's releases. She's assured that if they try anything funny, they'll go right back. She's even said that she feels grateful in a way for what happened to her because it has inspired her to pursue a career in the medical field. Coming out of such a horrible situation, she's expressed, 
Parents need to talk to their kids directly, saying, this is not real, this is fake when it comes to online figures like Slenderman. And to kids stuck in bad friendships, she has advised them to listen to their gut and get out before something bad happens, even if they feel guilted into staying friends with that person.